All right, and Sage Birchwater joins me now. Sage, how are you doing today? Oh, very well, thanks. Uh, terrific. I uh, always love talking to folks out in BC or out there in Williams Lake. Uh, what What is it like out there? We, we had our first like feel of summer here in Ottawa, but uh, how, how's the spring treating you out there in Williams Lake? It's been cold. And uh, <laughs> in fact, there was snow out west uh, in the Chilcotin and snow in Wells, Barkerville last night and uh, some of the higher places. So uh, okay. things are quite quite a bit behind. Normal, yeah. you know. uh, so, right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So it's taking some time to get into that nice spring summer weather out there. Hopefully it doesn't take too, too much longer, but again, you know, based off of, you know, fire seasons and all that, you know, I know. Everyone, the, the cool uh, is you don't actually, have another bad you know. season. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, uh, so as I said, in the intro, we're here talking about talking to the story keepers tales from the Chilcotin Plateau, your new book. And this is, as the title would indicate, a series of, of oral history stories. You went out, talked to a lot of folks. And I, I'm curious, we've, we've had people on the show before who have done oral history. And I'm always curious to start with the idea of taking oral histories and putting them onto paper and putting them into a written form. And I'm just curious to start, what was your approach in doing that and are all the stories that you heard, everything that you got from these interviews that you did, do they all translate well into a written format? Uh, well, I, I wrote them as as magazine articles, many of them. Uh, about five years ago, I had a collection uh, from with this little magazine called the Stew Magazine. And uh, they were, you know, a couple thousand words each. And uh, my publisher knew I had these stories and I had others as well. I've been a journalist in the Caribou Chilcotin for 40 years or more. And so I've, I've got this collection of stories. Uh, but my publisher, Vicki Johnstone of Caitlin Press, she, uh, she wanted me to upgrade them, to, to bring them to the moment. And she encouraged me to talk to the families of the people uh, that the stories are about because... Um, most of the people that I wrote about are, are gone now. You know, they, they're people I knew back in the eighties and nineties. And so, uh, I, that was the most interesting part of the process was talking to the families and it was trepidatious in a way too, because I was worried that they would reject my idea of publishing a story of their family and, uh, right. just the opposite. I got, I, I got a lot of enthusiasm. And what was that process like then approaching families? Because as you say, sometimes families might not want to necessarily share those stories or there might be some other issues, especially depending on how long a person maybe has been gone uh, and, and how much the, the memory is there, how much pain still exists from the, the loss of that individual. So how did you go about approaching the family members and really getting them to trust you because that's a big part of this that the families do have to trust you to to want to participate in this yeah that, that is a big part uh, one of the chapters i did was actually taken from uh other books that had been written about the uh, ralph edwards of lonesome lake the crusoe of lonesome lake so there's half a dozen books that were written by the family members and also by uh, biographers and uh, so I, in my, in my stew stories, I'd compiled about half a dozen uh, articles on, on the Ralph Edwards story. And I would, they were published, you know, uh, one month after the next, that kind of thing. So the family was aware of it. But when I wanted to compile it into a book, I was, I was worried that they might think, oh, you know, this is old news. We don't want to drag all that up again. But uh, actually, I, I spoke to the granddaughter, um, Susan Turner, who, uh, you know, she's Ralph Edwards' granddaughter, and her mother was Trudy Turner, and, and um, who's the daughter of Ralph Edwards. And they were, um, she was right enthusiastic with it. And she, I, I needed to vet the, the story by her anyway, the chapter by her, you know, for accuracy and fairness. And she had, you know, she so she gave a bit of a guiding hand in, in what she was comfortable presenting, and what, uh, you know, and and basically gave it the green light, and it added to the story. It brought the story alive because, you know, 
she didn't really know her grandfather very well. He was, you know, she was maybe four or five when he passed away. And, and so, uh, yeah. She wanted, so she you, asked, you get all, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. She, she just wanted to, uh, she expressed the desire to, she wished she could have met her grandfather and got to know him better. That's all. Yeah, so so you have these experiences where you're getting in touch with the the families to, to talk about these people, but I guess we should address too, who are the story keepers? You know, you, you say that this is a collection of these stories that you've done, or you did over a number of years as, as magazine pieces, but who are these individuals who you met over the years, and, and sort of how did you determine their value as storytellers? That that these were that these were people who you wanted to get to know better, who you wanted to hear. The stories that they were telling. Uh, well, there was a couple of matriarchs in the Chilcotin, uh, Chilcotin uh, matriarchs, who I'd known over the years, and uh, I'd written many stories about them, and um, so they were very interesting people. Uh, Emily X, Emily Lulu X, lived on a lake. She was a neighbor of mine in Tatlioko Valley, Tatlioko Valley. And she lived on a lake and lived the old time way. And so I had many experiences uh, meeting her. I, she and her husband, Donald X, would, would hitchhike everywhere they went. They didn't own a vehicle. And they'd just stand by the side of the road and, and people in the community would pick them up and take them where they wanted to go. And so that you'd go back to their camp and it was like going, it's like a big road, it's like a big road bump, you know, uh, it slowed you right down because it, you know, there was, it was just a, this backwoods little road, just, they had to go in granny gear just to, to navigate it. And you go back to where they set their net in the lake and where they were drying their, their fish or drying their deer meat or, and, and lots of different uh, times like that. We would, we'd spend time together. One, one time uh, the family decided that Emily needed to have a, an 80th birthday party. So they set it all up and they invited the family from right across the Chilcotin, which, you know, that's, you know, 300 and some odd kilometers across. And they, people came from and nobody had phones in there. This was 1994. And they, so they were all they brought they set up a stage and some musicians came from the Maya Valley and they were all ready to do it. Yeah, but lo and behold, Donald and Emily weren't there. They'd gone to a mm -hmm. funeral and, and funerals were a big social deal amongst the Chilcotin people. Well, I just happened to be at that funeral, and I, I saw saw Donald and Emily, and I says, "Gee, what are you guys doing here? Aren't you supposed to be back at Quitzine Lake?" And he says, "Oh, yeah, no, uh, maybe we'll catch a ride with you tomorrow." You know, so <laughs> I ended up bringing the guests of honor home for this great event, and uh, yeah, and so there was a hundred well, people there, and it was a beautiful time. Yeah. Yeah, well, I guess that speaks a little bit, and, and maybe as someone who is very far physically removed from the Chilcotin, certainly, that there's, and it comes across as you go through some of these stories, that there's a real sense of community to the region, and that yeah. the, the people who you profile are individuals who, while they were alive, were central to keeping these communities together and further building those communities. Is that a fair assessment on my part? That is a good, a good assessment, yes. And it is a. I see the whole region as a community, from Williams Lake right to Bella Coola. It's it's uh, you know, four hundred and something kilometers across, mm -hmm. and 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 there's these events, funerals, weddings, powwows, uh, potlatches. People all gravitate to these things, and and there's four different indigenous uh, nations in in that group. Uh, there's the Tsilkotin, there's the Shawepam, otherwise known as Shushwap. There's the Deketh or the Southern Carrier, and there's the Newhawk of Bella Coola. And so they're all different languages, and the cultures are quite radically different in some cases. Yet they get together and they, they have a camaraderie that's, that's remarkable. Like Alexander Mackenzie followed the Grease Trail, right. the Newhawk to Cal Grease Trail from, from around Quinell all the way to Bella Coola. And the reason he followed that grease trail is because of the friendship and the, the sense of, 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 a, of a community that existed between the Fraser River and the Central Coast. So the idea of this community or the, the idea that this region has a very communal atmosphere, does that predate 
necessarily than colonialization because because one of the things that comes across in the book are, is the stories that get lost or intentionally pushed aside through colon the, the process of colonialization so you know just just as we go back and, and some of these stories that that are told in the community that that is presented here just how important was colonialization to that to, and did the existing sense of community help to combat some of the more damaging sides uh, or impact of colonization in this particular region? Uh, well, each place is different, of course. Uh, like Williams Lake is closer to where the settlers were. So there was an impact on the Shwepam people that the Chilcotans didn't feel because their land was preempted. You know, like in Williams Lake, Chief William in 1860 was, he had a, he had a little uh, place near Williams Lake and uh this fellow named Davidson came along and says, oh, do you mind if I put a garden next to your place? You know, I'd like to build a cabin. He says, oh, yeah, no problem. So Chief William goes fishing and he comes back and Davidson had staked the whole area and offered William, Chief William, 20 bucks. And, and then Chief William didn't want the 20 bucks. He wanted his land. But that's that's what happened on Williams Lake. Out in the Chilcotin, it was more sparsely settled. There was less less colonial activity. I mean, the Chilcotin War kind of in 1864 kind of pushed back some of the settle, set, settlers. But um, again, it's a different vibe. Uh, and then down in Balakula, you've got a more concentrated settle, settlement and and a different culture altogether. You know, you've got a more, you know, sedentary in a sense. The, the, the coastal people had long houses and they the food came to them out in the plateau up on the Chilcotin. You had to go after your food. So you, you covered a great, great distance to go from one place to another. So when we're thinking about the region, we're thinking about some of these stories that are being told. What What is the general time frame of the book and, and the stories that are being shared? Because again, the, the book gets into ideas of colonialization and, and some of these other oral traditions. So for someone coming to the book, what can they expect in terms of just general time frame of a region that has a very diverse, very long history of human activity? Yeah, I'd say um, the 1920s, maybe, uh, up to the present day. Um, I did a previous book five years ago called Chilcotin Chronicles, and it, it sort of dealt more with the 1860s and in, in that time time frame, but 1920s, uh, 1929 is an interesting year. Uh, Ralph Edwards came to the country in, in 1911, for example, and settled at Lonesome Lake. And then um, Tommy Walker, another figure in the book, another chapter, uh, came from England in 1929 and settled at, at a place called Stewie in uh, the Bella Coola Valley. And uh, just before the Great Depression hit. So that was an interesting timing for, for mm. that. Um, and some of the other people like uh, were born, so, like Lucy Selin was born around 1904. And Emily X was born in 1914. And the, the, um, the Haynes family, I've got a, a chapter on the Haynes family of Tatlico, and they were born from 1913 until 1923 or something like that. So that that's the time frame. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to know, how did these people's stories, how do various stories become hidden uh, within the, the culture there? Because again, you talk about the, the community of it and that these are, are people who are central. He's talked about a couple of matriarchs and yet the books really presents it as stories that, need to be told because they've either been forgotten or they've been just sort of relegated to just the family and and folks around the area don't know as much as perhaps maybe they used to as, as time goes on as tends to be the case uh, but but generally speaking how, how would you say that a story gets hidden or how would you classify a quote-unquote hidden story well it disappears because uh the people disappear you know older older people die i mean you take it for granted when you're sitting around a kitchen or a, or a campfire and people are sharing stories about Eagle Lake Henry or about, you know, Chi Wheat or somebody uh, or their mother or their, you know, 
you take it for granted that the story will always be there because it was kept alive orally. Uh, but as soon as somebody passes on, all of a sudden there's a, a big chapter missing, you know. And so uh, I, I got a, a trigger moment that happened. Um, I, I started, you know, I moved out to the Chilcotin in uh, 1977 to live on a trap line. I was part of the back to the land movement, and that was part of the incentive to, to go back to the land, to live on a trap line. Anyway, I'd lived there for a while, and, and then I started freelance writing and doing covering some of the local events. And one day, uh, my, my wife and I and our two kids were uh, camped at a place called Clean a Clean, uh, Clearwater Lake at Clean a Clean. And we had a cabin tent, you know, uh, log walls and then a, a canvas tent over top. And we, we were there and we, we kept that camp for the winter there. Well, one day, and it was a, in late fall, Lucy Celine showed up on horseback from Taudistan, which is 25 miles away, and she's 80 years old. And I thought, holy smokes, uh, that's an interesting story. So I, 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 I did an article about it. But I didn't have a camera, and I, I wished I had a camera because uh, uh, it was such a priceless moment. You know, here's an 80-year-old woman that rides 25 miles in late fall. It's below freezing a little bit and to buy a sack of flour from Thelma Petrie at the store. And, and this is, this is uh, Lucy Selin on the front cover of the book. Mm. And later I got a camera. So I, so I, um, I asked... Um, Diana French, who was the editor of the uh, Williams Lake Tribune, if she had a spare camera kicking around the office, you know, and she found one for me. It, the light meter didn't work, but she told me how to crop the, uh, you know, to <laughs> frame the, the images so that, you know, it's a little high or a little low. You can maybe get a good one. And and that's, you know, I realized that you, a, a camera is an important uh, tool to to reflect and capture the, the moments. And even this this picture of Lucy is has a story to it. You can see she, she made a good cover uh, for the book. Yeah. And, and what that was, her family, again, like Emily X, her family decided that she needed a birthday party. I think she was 85 and she'd never had a birthday party. So they held a big wing dang uh, birthday party for her at Anaheim Lake and invited the whole family. And there's 100 people there in the community hall. And they prepared this great big cake for her. It was like a an inferno because there was 80 candles plus lighting it up. And then they were all giggling and thinking, okay, poor granny's going to pass out by uh, trying to blow all these candles out like you're supposed to. <laughs> and this, this picture here of her is when she uh, picked up a pie plate and just two flicks of her wrist, all the candles went out and she's laughing about it. <laughs> So. <laughs> yeah, and she she seemed very happy. Like that that is a fun photo, a very expressive uh, yeah. image there uh, on the cover of the book. And I'm curious to know, like, for for you, how much of the of the stories being lost, or or that type of a a story being t told less and less, is part of maybe just changing cultures and. You know, do people gather together as much as they used to? You talk about sitting around the fire, sitting around the kitchen. Do, do those sort of events, independent of what's been going on the last two years, which obviously has hurt in person, getting together, mm -hmm. telling stories, but independent of that, culturally, it almost feels like we've increasingly shifted away from that towards whatever online stuff and, and communicating in different ways. You know, is there something that has been lost about in-person gatherings, in-person storytelling, that this book, to a certain extent, is trying to recapture that or highlight the value of that type of storytelling, that type of knowledge transmission. Yeah, I think it does because it it it, it reflects the time before there was television. We didn't have television in the Chilcotin. We didn't have phones in the Chilcotin. When I went out there in 77, there was no satellite televisions until maybe right. a year. 10 years later and well, maybe not quite 10 years later, but, you know, and so the communication, there was, uh, there was a, a couple of radio, uh, radio telephone, radio uh, 
public telephones along the side of the road. There was two, one in Tatlico Valley and one along the road. And if you wanted to call somebody, you, you picked up the, the receiver and you used whatever means to pay for it. Uh, the, you picked up the receiver and the operator would answer and they'd hit you up to the uh, whoever you want to talk to. Well, down in the valley, in Tatlico Valley, the, the pay phone was right next to Harry and Fran Haynes. And the telephone company put an extension into their house so that anytime the phone rang and somebody saying, oh, I got a message for Joe Blow, they would they'd get on their CB radio and, and let Joe Blow know that they had a phone message. So that was the communication. And then, of course, their kitchen was a real gathering place. You sure. Know, coffee and cookies. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I'm, I'm a historian of Canadian radio and I, I show maps in, in a lot of my classes to students of radio coverage in the 1930s, particularly after the CBC started putting up big transmitters in areas across the country. And, and someone will inevitably say, well, there's no coverage in most of BC outside of Vancouver and Victoria. And I say, yeah, you're right. BC is a bit of a mess in terms of transmission, just wireless transmission, the, the topography doesn't allow for it. And so in the 1930s, a lot of, there, it, there was more CBC outlets and stations in the 30s, this is still the case, than any other province because they needed so much local coverage for the the topography. They couldn't, you know, you, oh, could, yeah, have one, yeah. you could have one station in Saskatchewan that can cover the whole province if it's oh, powerful yeah. enough. You can't have that in British Columbia. And that kind of speaks yeah. to what you're talking about a little bit, that you don't have the, the communication revolution of sorts just happens later in BC for no other reason or, or if large reason because of the topography doesn't allow for it. And therefore you have situations like the one you mentioned where the communities themselves have to come together and create yeah. or maintain a sense of tight knitness that perhaps started to fray a little earlier in other parts of the country, perhaps. Yeah. One of, one of the communication links for uh, the Chilcotin and Balakula was this single strand telephone line that went from 150 mile house all the way to Balakula. And it was tied to trees. And once in a while, if there weren't any trees, they'd put up a, a pole and basically it went all the way down. And so I've got this wonderful story um, of this guy, Tommy Walker, who, um, who started this Tweedsmere Lodge. And he, he, he's the guy from England that showed up on, in 1929. And um, the guy, 10 miles up the road, he was the, he was the, BC, he was the telephone operator and, and technician. And he, he says, oh, Tommy, maybe you want to want a telephone in your cabin. So he put it in there. And then he put this big speaker thing in there. And Tommy says, what's that? And he says, well, that's a howler. And what's a howler? He says, well, you don't have to pick up the phone. You can just listen to it. And you could hear everybody else's conversations because it was all party <laughs> line. So one day, uh, one day a, a guy came down bringing some horses down from the Chilcotin to Tommy. He says, boy, Tommy, you, you must have had a pretty good party there back a couple months ago. He says, um, the guy in Anaheim Lake, he, he could hear your, your party while, while he was talking on the phone. Uh, it was so loud that his dog started barking. <laughs> and and uh, so Tommy thought that was pretty funny that 40 miles away that that uh, yeah. <laughs> this telephone conversation could make the dogs bark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. These are the sorts of stories that you see in the book. And now I, I don't want to necessarily spoil anything in the book, or you know, we want people to go pick it up because it, it is a, a great book, and you'll I, I think really enjoy the stories that are included, but. If you're willing, Sage, I would like to ask you about, and maybe even just tell at least part of the story, about the brass band at the old Emmanuel United Church and well, how it came to, yeah, and how it came to be that they are playing their instruments in the pews uh, as the church is being moved. <laughs> Yes, it's getting towed across the river. <laughs> and uh, Andy Cy Wallace was the one that was his favorite story to tell. And he, that's the last chapter in the book of Andy and Lillian. And uh, he'd always start out, he says, and Emmanuel United Church is the only church ever towed across the river, you know. And, and then you go into what that was all about. So 
it's it's a long story that uh, there were two villages in in Bella Coola. One was traditional, had long houses, and the other was more western, more with lumber frame houses. And they were on the the north side of the river because it's sunnier on the north side in, in these east west valleys. And but they were subject to these floods, so the Necklaskani River used to flood every once in a while, and it just wiped out the whole thing. So they finally, in, in 1936, they had the last flood that just convinced everybody they should move to the south side of the river. So the house, the only thing that wasn't, one of the only things not destroyed was Emmanuel United Church. So they decided they'll move it. So they got, they hooked up the bulldozers and they tried to pull it, but they, they couldn't move it. So Andy's favorite story was there. He says, well, then some smart Indian went into the church and realized that the the chimney was still attached to the cement. You know, they had to dis- disconnect it. Then they could move it and they pulled it across. Well, again, um, back in the 30s, uh, each each sort of generation had their own thing. And they developed this brass band. Andy's dad was part of it, Stephen Cy Wallace. And he played the trumpet and the and the trombone and different stuff, and so they they moved this thing across across the river, dragging it with two bulldozers, and and the brass band sat in in the pews playing "Onward, Christian Soldiers," and uh, got to the other side and set the church back up, set it up on, a, on the south side of the river. <laughs> just uh, yeah, just a remarkable story there, and that's the sort of thing that you're going to get in the book. And I'm curious to know for you, Sage, you, you tell that story, you talk about Andy as, a, as his favorite story to tell, and you get this sense both in talking to you and in the book that part of this, it seems like, is almost a, a tribute to those individuals. As for as much as it is about telling the story, you're also kind of paying tribute to them and their contributions to the community and, and what they did to, to help shape the area. And again, is that a fair conclusion on my part? And is this book really a, a part of what their legacy is to the Chilcotin area? Yeah, well, um, Andy and Lillian are long gone now. They, they passed away 15 years ago. But their son, um, Peter, uh, I spoke to him. I, you know, I had to get permission. You know, you're going to write about a family. You need permission. So I spoke mm-hmm. to Peter and I asked him what he thought uh, and, and let him vet. I, I let him vet the, uh, the article, the chapter. And he had things to add about that. And, and my comment was that Andy was a, a very generous guy, you know. Like he told these Newhawk stories to a white guy like me. And he was open about it, you know, and he shared like like one of his stories is that he got sent to, you know, down on the coast, the, the Catholics had the upper country, the Chilcotin, but down on the coast, it was the it was the United Church and the Methodists. So he and he got sent to a Methodist uh, residential school in, at Port Hardy, which is a long ways away. And he was there for years before he came back. And they tried to eradicate his Indianness out of him, his, his new hog, forget your language, forget your culture. It's all something old and it's not going to do you any good. And that's what they brainwashed them with. So at, at a certain point, Andy realized he wanted to learn his language and learn his culture and preserve his culture. So he spent his lifetime doing that. So when I, I talked to Peter about this, he says, you know, my dad shared stories with you, but he wouldn't share them with me because he was trying to protect me. And he says, mm-hmm. once I realized that that's why he did that, I I could forgive him for not teaching me the Newhawk language. And that was a very important right. point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and powerful too, because for as much as the book is, and people in Eastern Canada might say, well, it's a book, a book about the Chilcotin Plateau, and therefore maybe it's not relevant to me. But when you have these stories, and in particular that one, that's something that was replicated and is continuing to be replicated all over Canada. The, the, yeah. the damage that was done, the harm that was done, the trauma of residential schools and colonialism, that type of story, it's of 
an individual from the Chilcotin, but that's something that anybody from across the country who is unfamiliar with some of these issues will be able to benefit from because, you know, as part of reconciliation, we all need to engage with these types of stories. And uh, so it's so important that these are being told and uh, made accessible, especially in a situation like that, where, as you say, Andy didn't necessarily want to tell his, his son about it, but it's an important part of not only his history, but the nation's history as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, a good point. A good a summary so, there. Yeah. So, uh, so is there anything else though, that you might say to somebody, uh, you know, that's something for, that I think anybody across Canada or really anybody who might be listening to this anywhere around the world might benefit or, or really engage with a story like that. But for anybody else who's outside of the Chilcotin, and obviously I think people with inside, uh, inside Chilcotin would, would see obviously just from the title that, Oh, this is something that I might really like. But for anyone outside of it, how would you try to maybe sell the book to them or, or, or you know, have, have them try to engage with, with what you're writing here? Okay, well, I'll give you an example. Like, okay, for one thing, Bella Coola isn't the Chilcotin. It's, it's the central coast. It's, it's right at sea level and it's a whole different culture and a whole different climate and everything else. But it, it's part of the Caribou Chilcotin Coast region. Anyway, um, where Andy Siwalis lived, he, he real, back in 1884, there was a, a fission within the, within the Newhawk community. And some of them wanted to hang on to their old ways, their, their, the dances, the masks, the, the language. And the, the other, other half wanted to, they got, the guy got converted to Christianity. By the uh, by, the Methodist minister. So he burned all his regalia. He burned his masks and he burned his blankets, and 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 that's when they started the other village on the north side of the of the river. So after that was in that was in like uh, 1894. So when Andy was Andy was born in 1924. So he there was quite a bit of time frame in there, and. He he, uh, they were devout members of the Emmanuel United Church. By the time he was born, his family was part of it, so they were Christian in that sense. But he was also an, a, a strong uh, proponent of New Hawk culture. Uh, you, you'd have a potlatch, and Andy threw a couple of potlatches with his his uh, family members, and he's always very strong in his culture as well. So anyway, they. The story of the of the Manual United Church is they had to tear it down, and they decided they were going to tear it down, which to me seemed very sad. But they they decided they wanted to build a new one because it was very cold in the winter, and and they wanted a nice new church. So they did that. They tore it down. They built a new church, and and I was standing on the front porch of the new church with Andy, uh, just as they were sort of celebrating the new church. And he just, he was an elder in the church and he wore his, his regalia in there, his blanket and everything. And then we're standing on the front porch and he says, and you see that hill behind me? He says, that's the hill that saved our people from the flood. And it's like, holy mackerel, there's some mythology, some ancient New Hawk beliefs. And here he is, he's, he's got a foot in both worlds. And he, he relates to, the, to both sides. And that's, that's really what blew my mind. Uh, opened my eyes and his mm. his son peter said the same thing he said his his grandmother explained to him how how the the mythology of the new hawk goes back to the dark times before you know it's like in genesis and the bible when the you know the first day there was no light well they have the same stories so so that was interesting to me yeah. And as you say, stories that uh, anyone I think will read and enjoy in the book. So again, it's talking to the story keepers tales from the Chilcotin Plateau. Sage, if people want to pick up a copy of the book or keep up with uh, some of the other work that you've done over the course of their, your career, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, I, I go to your favorite bookstore and, and ask for it. It's published by Caitlin Press. Um, I mean, I'll sell you a book for 30 bucks. Uh, 
if you want to get a hold of me and uh, I'll mail it to you for 30 bucks. <laughs> there <laughs> so you it's go. Bertswater uh, at Shaw.ca. <laughs> there you go. All right. Yeah. Direct from the author. We like that. Uh, you get a signed so copy. Encourage... It's double the value on eBay if it's signed. That's right. Exactly. That's what I, I've, I've gone to an event before, right when uh, a book that I was involved with came out and we had to bring like a door prize for a raffle. I brought a signed copy of the book and, yeah. uh, I, I said to the, I actually wrote a, a, on a sticky note that I put in the cover. I said, this might make this worth, you know, 10 cents more when you well, try to least. sell it on, on eBay in 10, <laughs> in 10 minutes. Uh, but yeah, it's, so definitely check it out. Check the show notes. We'll link to, uh, the Caitlin press website as well. If you want to pick up a copy or over on active history.ca. So again, tales from the story key, or excuse me, talking to the story keepers, tales from the Chilcotin plateau, Sage Birchwater. Thanks so much for joining me today. Hey, thanks so much, Sean.